in order to judge a situation, I have to stand apart from it. So the, the situation now becomes an object and I become a subject. And that subject we attach the label I to. Uh, this is what I want, or this is what I think, or this is my opinion. This is what I think should happen or shouldn't happen. Um, there's that standing apart uh, that happens. Um, but this is a consciousness also. And uh, this is this is why um, there are different names for consciousness uh, in Buddhism. So, um, for example, the sense consciousness we've been talking about, the hearing, touching, tasting, smelling, uh, whether conscious or unconscious, in fact, this is called Vijnana. So Vijnana simply arises when uh, sense data comes in through the sense doors. You know, then sense consciousness arises. That's what's known as the 18 Dhatu. Uh, as I said, there are six sense bases. Um, so the sense object, the sensing, the, the sense itself, uh, and then the consciousness that is a light of that self, that's three. So three times six is 18. Those are the 18 Dhatu. And the Buddha called this the all as well, the ocean of the all. Um, this is all, all that there actually is. And so... Um, there's that, and that functions anyway, regardless. It never gets switched off until, you know, the day we die. Even people in comas, it's known that people lying in hospital in a coma um, can still sense things, even though they may not be able to respond to them physically anymore. Um, so, yeah, you know, people come out of comas and report that they were able to hear and see what was going on in the room with them. So... On top of that then, or in addition to, or as well as, maybe not on top of, but as well as, there's another form of consciousness, which is conscious awareness. This is what's perhaps um, uh, more aligned to the Sanskrit term sati. We had vijnana for sense consciousness. Sati generally is, um, means mindfulness, but it basically means awareness. You know, this is the Satipatthana Sutta, the Four Foundations of Awareness or Four Foundations of Mindfulness, as it's actually called. And this is the being aware of something. So sense consciousness is coming in, uh, for example, um, and, uh, uh, you know, there's an awareness of it. Uh, as we said, in sleep, uh, uh, or if I'm very distracted in a daydream, I'm, I may not hear the dripping tap. Um, or the the cat meowing or whatever, if I'm really gone, um, even though it is coming in through the sense gates and it is being registered um, as well in the heart, uh, there may not be actual awareness of it. So that awareness is called sati. So there's a difference there, sati. Um, and indeed, the awareness of myself uh, also tends to arise in sati, you know. Um, I am, because there is this awareness of hearing or seeing or touching, I see myself as separate. I take the ex the delusion takes the extra step. Instead of recognizing that this consciousness is uh, simply differentiated parts of a continuum, um, not a separate entity in its or a thing in itself, the mistake arises of the delusion of I. And so, even though I am not there uh, from time to time, as we've said, it doesn't matter, uh, so to speak. The uh, uh, the thought objects supported by the emotional household maintains a view, uh, a, a wrong view, obviously, of a separate entity, which is called I, me, myself, with my likes, my dislikes, my opinions, particularly. Uh, we looked at opinions quite recently, actually. Um, so these certainly are used to maintain this delusion of a separate entity. And this is how it goes um, in, in Buddhism. So this is why in the practice of, of meditation, uh, the thought coverings are allowed to rest as it were to to disappear um and we and there's a recognition therefore that there is this underlying consciousness that is ever present actually uh it's ever present and of course it extends beyond that a little bit as well i mean because we could say well what is consciousness uh the problem is that of course when i think about consciousness i'm always thinking about a thing 
that I'm calling consciousness. So I say, you know, um, does it exist outside of me or does it exist inside of me? Um, but if we look at the Buddha's teaching of the 18 Dhatu, where the 18 Dhatu is actually the schema of the heart or the mind. So the heart or the mind takes in, you know, the sense objects, the sense and the sense consciousness. It's the, it is seen. And, and the important thing is that those three are interdependent. Um, they are completely interdependent for their own individual existences. Uh, this is what Sokian is referring to later on when he says, in the Orient, uh, the word individual does not exist. What he means there is not that there aren't individuals. Of course there are. There's you and me, there's this tree, the oak tree, which is different from that oak tree, and is different from uh, the elder over there. Um, what he's saying, though, is is that the individual is not separate. So he's saying there's no separation uh, between individuals. There's an interconnectedness. There's a web. Um, this is what's known as the teaching of dependent origination, the Pratichat Samutpada. And it's also the meaning of emptiness as well, because the Mahayana schools ran with that. Um, because the Buddha did say that dependent origination is the most profound teaching that he has given. Then he said, one who fully sees into the dependent origination sees the Dharma itself. And he who sees the Dharma sees dependent origination. So it absolutely goes, you know, this all goes together. So emptiness simply means emptiness of self. It doesn't mean nothing or void, as you've said many times. Um, it means emptiness of self and in the absence of a separate self, there is just dependent origination. There's just interconnectedness. Um, there's just the that schema of the 18 data. And the 18 data doesn't belong to anybody. It's... Um, it's, it is actually, if you, if you like, it's just a map of the mind. Um, you know, it's a map, it's a map of, of the way things really are. Uh, so, yes, it, at this point, outside and inside all break down. Because where does, if everything is interconnected, where does one thing end and another thing begin? Um, the eye discerns. Um, differences. Um, you know, my eye can discern the difference between the table and the floor, um, but the table is standing on the floor, and if it wasn't for the floor, the table would not be there. And this is the same for everything. Um, you know, so I see the shirt on my own back, for example, and someone comes up and takes the shirt off my back, as the saying puts it. And I say, Oi, that's my shirt, because my eye my understanding discerns the shirt as a separate reality, an entity in itself. But the shirt is not an entity in itself. At one time there was no shirt. It was it's cotton, the shirt I'm wearing. So it was part of a plant at one time. And then through a process it became becomes a shirt. But, uh, but that shirt wasn't on my back. Um, it was in another part of the world. And then it gets transported here. And then I buy it. And then... I'm wearing it, and I, and today, as I'm giving this talk, it so happened that uh, when I was getting dressed, the sh this shirt was chosen and put on. Uh, otherwise, if I didn't choose this shirt, if, even if it was in the drawer in the in the bedroom, it would have been another shirt that was being worn, and that would have been the shirt that came off my back. So, as it were, this this shirt has a story doesn't it? It has a story that uh, as it moves through time and at some point it will be destroyed. You know, it will fall apart or whatever. Maybe it'll be turned into rags first, but then at some point the elements will decompose, um, as will the wearer as well. Uh, so everything has a story of interdependence. Um, and, you know, I, I may say, well, I own this shirt, but if the time comes for uh, a thing to fall apart, then that's part of its story. We tend to see the object as an entity in itself. And I say, well, what can I do to, st to stop these changes actually happening? Well, in the Buddhist realm, nothing, because they will happen anyway. It's a little bit like the story of the uh, young uh, temple boy who, um, you know, uh, whilst he's dusting one day uh, in the temple, he manages to knock off uh, and uh, uh, the one of the val temple valuables, which is a little teacup, uh, which is very ancient and extremely precious, and the cup falls onto the floor and smashes. 
and the boy picks it up and uh, uh, holds it behind his back and goes through to the master and says, Master, he says, uh, you know you always teach that everything is impermanent. Yes, he said, this is what our Lord the Buddha taught us. Uh, and that everything ha comes to be, has a duration and then ceases to be. Yes, he said, this is the teaching of the Buddha, the teaching of impermanence. And the boy brings out the broken pieces and says, unfortunately, the cup has reached the end of its existence. So you can always try that um, if need be.